you very much. Uh, thank you all of you for uh, staying, and uh, it's a pleasure really to be here to be able to share with you all the progress uh, in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. These are my disclosures. And so I think many of you are familiar um, with whole genome sequencing that really changed the way we look at this disease. This led to the recognition of a highly recurrent mutation in the MYD uh, ADA gene. Uh, this has now been subsequently confirmed by multiple laboratories um, in, in many countries with uh, prevalence for the mid 88 mutation being about 95, maybe upwards to 97% of patients. What's important to also understand is that this mutation can also be present in IgMM GUS patients, um, and this gives us a sense that this is a early oncogenic event uh, for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Very importantly, uh, the detection of MED88 has helped us sort out Waldenstrom's from other diseases that often look like Waldenstrom's, uh, such as IgM secreting um, multiple myeloma, marginal zone lymphomas, uh, even uh, CLLs. And within patients that have the IgM MGUS, the stronger the mid-88 signal that one can see uh, with um, PCR, um, these patients often um, are the ones that then uh, go on to become Waldenstrom's patients. But besides the diagnostic utility for this mutation, what it has also helped us is to understand the pathogenesis. Uh, the mid 88 mutations uh, transactivate NF kappa B, which is a very important growth and survival uh, protein uh, for Waldenstrom cells. And uh, this you know, has been shown both by transduction studies, uh, but you know, putting in the various mutations, the activating mutations that have been detected in Waldenstrom's as well as in ABC, DLBCL, and looking at NF kappa B, but also using mid 88 inhibitors. Uh, and showing, in fact, that NF-kappa B signaling within the nuclei of cells could be silenced out uh, with the addition of a mid-88 inhibitor. Now, when you have these kinds of observations, what you need next is a good electrician. And uh, in this case, um, we were very lucky to have Guang Yang in our laboratory, who has spent the last uh, four years trying to understand how this um, mutation actually functions and supports the growth and survival of Waldenstrom cells. So normally, MYD88 is an adapter protein. It actually signals for toll receptors. These are receptors that are normally present on immune cells that sense for bacteria and viral particles, but also interleukin-1, a very important inflammatory protein. And so when ligand engages those receptors, Typically what it then does is it causes MYD88 to dimerize, and this creates a signal. Now, if you have the mutation, you no longer need the ligand. So the MYD88 protein is able to um, self-assemble and cause signaling. And when it self-assembles, it actually does two very interesting things. One, it recruits these proteins called the Iraq proteins that actually signal NF-kappa B, but also, very importantly, it recruits in Bruton's tyrosine kinase, the target of ibrutinib, as well as multiple other uh, BTK inhibitors that have been developed. And so through divergent pathways, you see the activation of NF-kappa B. But what is also interesting about uh, MYD um, itself is that it can also upregulate through various pathways HCK, hematopoietic cell kinase. And this actually uh, is also a target, a very, very potent target of a brutinib. And this is what actually activates BTK, allowing it to bind to mid-88, but it also turns on AKT as well as ERK signaling. So you see a very comprehensive way that the mid-88 mutation is able to take over the growth and survival signaling uh, of Waldenstrom cells. Now, in addition to acquiring the mutation, it's also very important uh, that you also lose some of the breaks that are very important in controlling mid-88 signaling. Uh, and this has actually been largely worked out in my laboratory thanks to the work of Zach Hunter and now Maria Luisa Guerrera, who's joined us from uh, the University of Pavia. Uh, and what they were able to detect is within the 6Q chromosome, 
there are a number of um, protein uh, genes that code for proteins that are essential uh, for controlling um, mediated signaling, uh, such as the inhibitor of BTK, um, various NF-kappa B regulatory genes that include TNF-AIP3 as well as HIVB2, but also in this 6Q locus, which is often lost in about 50 to 80% of patients with Waldenstrom's, you also see BCLAF1, which is an important modulator of BCL2. So within this area of loss are very important regulatory genes. Now, in addition in my laboratory, thanks to the work of Zachary Hunter, and subsequently ex extensive work that was done by Xavier Leloux here in France, as well as Aldo Rocaro, uh, now in, uh, at University of Brescia in Italy, was the identification of this other uh, mutation in the CXCR4 gene. So normally these mutations are all clustered in the C-terminal domain, and almost always they accompany the mid-88 mutation. You see it in about 30 to 40% of Waldenstrom's patients, and they tend to be exclusive of the deletion 6Q. So you either have one or the other. Usually these are subclonal in nature, um, and the median uh, clonal distribution is about 45%, but they can also be disease defining. When you see these mutations, usually they're in the patients that have the high serum IgM levels, as well as the ones that are presenting with symptomatic hyperviscosity. And very importantly, thanks to the work of Yang Kao uh, in my laboratory, as well as uh, uh, Aldo Rocaro, we also know that these mutations can also uh, promote drug resistance to various drugs, including Ibrutinib that I'm gonna talk about uh, through enhanced AKT and ERK signaling. Now, there have been now over, actually it should say 40 types of CXCR4 mutations which have been identified. They're all within that C-terminal domain. Roughly half of them are nonsense mutations that cause a cleavage of that C-terminal domain but there are also mutations that result in frame shifting. And the, depending on the kind of mutation you have can actually affect very much uh, the signaling. Despite the fact that these tend to be subclonal, uh, through transcriptome analysis that we published um, um, a few years ago, you end up seeing that these patients that carry the CXCR4 mutations tend to have a very uniform uh, transcriptional sign signature compared to the patients that carry the CXCR4 wild type. So with this in mind, we were very interested in looking at the impact of these mutations on drug therapy in Waldenstrom's. And I think many of you are familiar with the fact that Ibrutinib uh, was uh, approved after a pivotal trial that we ran um, by the FDA as well as the EMA. And within this uh, population of previously treated patients, we looked at the impact of these mutations. So overall, the response rate in this trial was 90% with a major response rate, PR or better, of 27% and VGPRs of 27%. Now, when you look at the breakdown of the mutations, those patients that have the mid-88 mutation actually do very well. They tend to respond, but if they also have the CXCR4 mutation, the deeper responses, the ability to get VGPRs is much less. And the time to be able to get uh, responses, um, major responses, is also slower. It's six months compared to two months for the CXCR4 wild type. If you don't have the mid-88 mutation, you don't really see um, much in the way of um, significant activity in these patients. And also, the mutations impact how the patients do from a progression-free uh, survival standpoint. Though in this trial, as we um, reported at ASH, we still have not reached the median PFS, now projecting over five years of sustained benefit in these previously treated patients, you do see the differences. The ones that have the mid-88 mutation but are CXCR4 wild type, meaning no mutation, they do extremely well. Those that have the CXCR4 mutation uh, they've already hit their median progression-free survival, which is about 42 months. And actually, this isn't bad if you think that these are heavily pre-treated patients. And those that have had no mid-88 mutation, uh, they actually uh, dropped off uh, very, very fast. And this was also the observation that Thanos made in another trial of patients that had actually rituxan refractory Waldenstrom's 
where they also showed that the decrease in IgM as well as improvement in hemoglobin uh, lagged for the patients that had the CXCR4 mutation. Now in this upfront trial that we also reported um, at, uh, at ASH, we also saw that even though we got really nice responses, everyone responded who was on the trial, you could see that the deep responses, the very good partial responses and better, um, was uh, much better if you had no CXCR4 mutation versus if you did. And also the time to get those major responses was also much, much more quickly. Now, in addition, um, we have been interested in trying to understand why these patients progress. And uh, uniformly, what we found is that one of the key mutations that is acquired by these patients is actually in BTK itself, in the CIS481 site, which is where ibrutinib is able to bind to Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And what is very interesting among the Waldenstrom's patients is that you tend to see multiple different types of BTK mutations within these patients. In fact, for these uh, P2 and P3 patients in this uh, paper we published in Blood, they had four different types of BTK cis481 mutations. Um, and the patient with, who's denoted as P6 here uh, had two different types. All of these patients, by the way, with BTK cis mutations tend to also be uh, CXCR4 mutated individuals. So that tells us something, that these may be patients that have an underlying genomic instability, which uh, allows for the creation of these uh, BTK cis uh, mutations. So in the last couple of uh, slides, I just want to uh, talk about strategies that we're now focusing on to be able to enhance BTK inhibitor activity in Waldenstrom's disease. Well, of course, uh, CXCR4 comes to mind, and you know that there are many inhibitors that are out there, including one that you probably have used, which is the Plorexa4 drug, except that the half-life of that drug is actually very short and not really, um, you know, has the potential for long-term sustained therapy. But on the other hand, there is this antibody, Ulocuplumab, which is a CXCR4 binding uh, antibody and antagonizes CXCR4 binding to the CXCR4 receptor. And this is a trial which we began uh, using ibrutinib with ulocuplumab in CXCR4 um, mutated patients. And I have to say that right off the bat, it's been a very e exciting experience to see how fast the responses are happening and how well the patients have been tolerating therapy. So I think this is one trial uh, that we're really very, very excited about. Now, the other um, area of interest in terms of advancing BTK inhibitor therapy uh, is to go after uh, BCL2, and I'll ta tell you a little bit about the role itself. But, you know, in the United States, usually we throw up a slide with football, and I think Ken Anderson would have been, if he had been here, he would have been very excited to see that. I, I know here in Europe, soccer is far more important, but you can al always see this as a very challenging soccer game where you've got one team trying to score a goal, and that's what ibrutinib is trying to do, induce apoptosis of the cell. But on the other hand, you have this very powerful opponent, uh, BCL2, that's trying to block that progress. Uh, and BCL2 is uh, overexpressed in patients with Waldenstrom, particularly those individuals that have the mediated 8 mutation, irrespective of whether or not they carry uh, an underlying CXCR4 mutation. And in modeling that we did in our laboratory, utilizing cells both transduced with a CXCR4 wild-type vector or one that actually had a CXCR4 mutant protein, what we saw right off the bat was that if you added ibrutinib, or you added uh, venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, you ended up seeing some early evidence of apoptosis, but not a lot. But when you added both drugs together, as you can see here, ABT uh, with ibrutinib, across the board, whether the cells were CXCR4 wild type or CXCR4 mutant, you ended up getting very potent apoptosis of these cells. And this was also true of whether we took cells from the patients, um, that included treatment-naive patients or patients that had been previously and were on uh, ibrutinib therapy. So for this reason, we've been very keen in developing venetoclax uh, for patients with Waldenstrom's. This is a trial that is being run by my colleague, uh, Jorge Castillo, uh, and we've been very excited about the high response rates and um, 
the tolerance that we've seen with this drug in patients with Waldenstrom's, and Hori will be presenting the study uh, at EHA this year. And the successor study that we are now planning on is combining ibrutinib along with venetoclax uh, in treatment-naive patients. So that should hopefully be open uh, this fall. Now, I've said to you a lot about this mid-88 you know, world, which is, um, you know, there are a number of uh, mutations uh, that have been found. I can actually see them on my slide, but you can't see all the others here. But that's not the point. The point is to really now talk a little bit about the mid-88 wild type world, which in and of itself is very, very interesting. So I mentioned earlier that we use often mid-88 to distinguish patients from other IgM secreting uh, diseases. But there is really this entity of mid-88 wild type uh, Waldenstrom's which can't really be separated if you look at the clinical uh, as well as laboratory characteristics. And one thing to keep in mind is, as we showed in this paper, is often when these patients are being referred to you as mid wild type, they may have some other diagnosis. And that's why we need to be really careful. And among many of these patients, what we found in this study were IgM myeloma patients. These patients typically um, are also mid wild type, but they tend to present with very high levels of IgM. In fact, the median here was over 8,000. The way to distinguish these patients is to look for cycling D1 as well as the translocation 1114, which tends to be very characteristic of, of, of these uh, IgM uh, myeloma patients. Now, why it's important to know about this subgroup of Waldenstrom's is because when you look at their overall survival, it tends to be less than the patients who are mid mutated. And CXCR4 itself doesn't appear to affect their overall survival. And you may ask what may be one of the reasons why these patients uh, show you know, poor survival. And that has to do with transformation of disease to aggressive lymphoma. We see a much higher um, incidence of transformation for these patients with an odds ratio of 23 as shown here. And those patients that tend to transform uh, show inferior survival. So given these um, characteristics, we were very much intent in being able to define the genomic landscape of these patients. And this is work that we just recently completed. And what we found, in fact, were multiple mutations in the CBM complex, uh, the CARD11, BCL10, MALT1 uh, um, mutations, as well as uh, PTPN13 mutations that modulate I-kappa B-alpha, and very importantly, also mutations that are very close uh, to NF-kappa B signaling itself, such as TBL1XR1, NF-kappa Biz, NF-kappa BID. These are all mutations which just got reported, in fact, this week in the New England Journal of Medicine by Lou Stout's groups in patients with uh, aggressive lymphoma. And so it makes sense now that we have these very bad actors, uh, in fact, modulating this disease. And also it makes sense because all these mutations are downstream of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is why these uh, mutations um, you know, would, would uh, predict for why uh, a drug like ibrutinib would not work. Despite the fact that you see all these different mutations that are not mid-88, um, when you do a principal component analysis of the top 500 differentially expressed genes between these Waldenstrom cells and normal memory B cells, what you see in fact is that there's actually a very nice clustering in the top genes. So even though these are, this disease is driven by non mid 88 and multiple types of mutations, still the transcriptional profile that they tend to create is very similar. And that makes sense because when you look at the disease under the microscope and look at its behavior, um, it's very hard to distinguish from mid mutated WM. Now, why we're all excited about these developments is because we now have the opportunity to be able to use a precision medicine approach to Waldenstrom's, relying on both mid as well as CXCR4 mutations. And I just want to run through this because I think it is really telling of where we hope, you know, the field will be for this disease as well as others. So if you have a patient who is mid mutated, but no CXCR4 mutation, most of these patients actually would benefit with ibrutinib if it's available. In patients that have bulky disease, big lymph nodes, um, and uh, extramedullary disease, we tend to default to bendamustine. 
For those with amyloidosis, we tend to default to a bortezomib-based therapy. And those with IgM neuropathy, we tend to use rituximab, either alone or combination. Now, if you have a mutated patient with a CXCR4 mutation, what you're gonna be concerned about is how fast you can get that response. And if you're looking for a fast response, herebrutinib may not be the right answer um, at this point in time. And if you need an immediate response, you know, either bortism or bendamustine therapy might be helpful. And herein lies the challenge now, immediate wild type patients. And, um, and you want to make sure that they don't have non-L265P mutations in mid-88, which are rare, but you can find them. And so for the time being, these are patients that we tend to use either bortezomib or bendamustine-based therapy. So in concluding, I just want to um, acknowledge all my uh, colleagues, um, both in the basic science laboratory as well as translational and clinical side, including my colleague, uh, Jorge Castillo, who have helped make all this progress possible. And uh, my last slide here is just to um, remind everybody that next year's uh, IMW will be held in uh, Boston, and uh, we hope to be able to welcome uh, many, if not all of you, uh, to the next international workshop. Thank you very much for your kind attention.